Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us at Secular AZ today. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization focused on protecting the Constitution and the separation of church and state now for over a decade in Arizona. Uh, we've got some incredible programming, including our Friday updates from all kinds of amazing speakers, including historians, authors, elected officials, journalists. Um, and in the coming weeks, we got, you can see on the screen, we've got some really great programming coming up. One thing I've been excited about is that we're doing a series about Arizona's criminal justice system and are going to have some conversations about prison labor, private prisons, what it's like for an inmate in Arizona's prisons, and uh, the two-tiered criminal justice system, just to name a few really depressing talk topics, but things that are necessary for us to talk about. Um, but today, I'm really excited because we are going to be speaking with Morgan Mari Marietta. And I, I don't know if it's Marietta or if it's just Marietta. Uh, it's just Marietta. <laughs> okay. Uh, he is a professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, where he teaches constitutional politics and political uh, psychology, focusing on the political consequences of belief, which we are seeing an awful lot of these days. Yeah. A lot uh, of he is, <laughs> it's too many to keep track of, right? Um, he's the author of four books, including A Citizen's Guide to the Constitution and the Supreme Court, and most recently, One Nation, Two Realities, Dueling Facts in American Democracy. He is the editor of the annual SCOTA series at Paul Grave Macmillan on the major decisions of the uh, Supreme Court, and he's a regular commentator on the court at theconversation.com. Uh, and I'm sure that Lindsay's going to be putting these links in there for everybody. His new book project is The Supreme Court of Facts on the role of the court in settling disputed perceptions of reality. So welcome, Morgan. And is there anything that I missed in your bio that you'd like to include? No, no, I think that uh, that's more than enough. Thanks so much. <laughs> sure. And so uh, I'm going to hand it over to you. But in the meantime, if anybody who's joined us today has any questions, by all means, you can throw them into the chat uh, or the Q&A. Uh, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat so everybody knows who you are. And when you do that, just make sure that you uh, make sure that the little uh, option there is for everybody to see your comments. So welcome, Morgan, and I'm going to hand it right over to you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for having me here today. Uh, these are truly revolutionary times at the Supreme Court and in constitutional law, especially about the constitutional law of religion. This last year, there was so much discussion about abortion, so much about guns, uh, that I think a lot of the discussion of this massive change in the law of religion was drowned out a bit. And one of the reasons that I do things like this, and uh, earlier they mentioned about the, the, the SCOTUS annual series and things at the conversation, uh, is that there's a thing in academics that constitutional law is really for specialists. And we do these scholarly things that about 10 people read. Uh, but I really don't think that's true. I think that constitutional politics in particular really is not for specialists. It's for citizens. It's our constitution, and we should take part in this debate. And there is a massive debate going on right now at the court and in society about the meaning of the constitution. Uh, so this is a really good time to be talking about the changes in law of religion. Uh, so what I thought I would do today uh, when I was asked to speak, uh, Lindsay said, oh, just, you know, talk as long as you want. And that's a very bad idea when you're talking to professors because they will, in fact, uh, talk forever. So I thought I would just say three brief things, <laughs> maybe talk for about a half hour or so and give us plenty of time for uh, discussion, uh, uh, commentary and such. I wanted to say three things. The first one is about the massive change in the court that has happened about the reading and understanding of the constitution. Complete change in constitutional regime about how to read the constitution. And that's the background to everything that is going on. The second thing are the changes that just happened last year in 2022 in the law of religion. And this is the Carson case and the Kennedy case you've heard about. And there's some doctrine that has come out of that. It's very important to see, oh, that's that uh, that PDF thing there. It gives you some detail on this we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, the exact doctrine has not been talked about a great deal, but it's very clear and it's going to be very influential. And the final third thing that I want to talk about is the future of what this is all going to mean uh, in our society. And there are two big cases up this year. You all know about 303 Creative uh, the LGBT rights and service denial case. The other one, this one just uh, came up. It was accepted last Friday, so it was a week ago, is the Groff case, 
and this is the post office case. I hadn't planned to talk about this one, but uh, I didn't know it was going to be taken and the court is going to rule on this. This is also going to be a massive case. Uh, I had a cold. Uh, this is, if you have children, you know that um, it's the, the petri dish effect. And I had this a bad cold and I was down for three days. You can still tell I had it. And um, so I wasn't paying attention to the news. And then I, I I went back to it and suddenly realized, oh, wow, they took the Graf case. So I've got to add this in to the talk here. So let's talk about these three things. The first one is the revolutionary change at the Supreme Court that has happened. And it is impossible to exaggerate, to, um, to overstate the degree of change that has happened. This is a complete alteration in a constitutional regime from one constitutional theory, meaning a way of reading the constitution to another one. And this is the shift from what's described as a living constitution to an original constitution or living constitutionalism to originalism. And this has everything to do with the Trump justices. This is about the nomination of Gorsuch and Kavanaugh and Barrett. When it was Gorsuch replacing Scalia, that was not such a major change. When Kavanaugh <clears throat> replaced Kennedy, that was a bit of a change that was important because, you know, the Kennedy had written all the major LGBT rights cases from Romer, um, Lawrence, Obergefell. Uh, but the massive change came when Barrett replaced Ginsburg. And this created the 6-3 court. And the most important thing to understand about the 6-3 court is not that it's a dominant majority. Uh, you think, well, 5-4 is a majority. 6-3 uh, is very different from 5-4 for this reason. It's the selection of the cases. People often assume that the cases just come to the court, and the only thing that counts is how the court decides about them. So 5-4 is the same as a 6-3. <clears throat> that is not true at all. The Supreme Court decides its own cases. So if you only have uh, a majority of five, and one of those is Roberts, you think, oh, I don't know if I even want to take this controversy and decide it, because you could lose the majority and it could come out on the other side. If you have six, however, you can lose Roberts on one, you can lose Gorsuch on another one, and you still will maintain the majority. So when you have six, you're perfectly willing to swing for the fences and take cases that you wouldn't have taken. And you see this in Barrett's first year, it wasn't actually all that radical. It was her second year because she was involved in the case selection, the first year of the cases that were heard in 2022. And they immediately voted to, you only need four justices of the court to take a case. And they immediately took the gun case, they took the abortion case, they took the religion cases, they took the EPA case. Uh, five justices make a majority, but six can make a movement. And that is what is happening now. Uh, so what is this movement? It is a shift in constitutional theory, meaning how you read the document. And let me just say um, 60 seconds on the debate uh, that people spend hours and hours and lives uh, debating. It depends on whether you read the Constitution from the perspective of the author or the owner. And people talk about this in English literature in terms of how you read a text. Like if you're reading Romeo and Juliet, do you read it for the ideas that Shakespeare wanted you to see, what he was thinking, and you try to understand what he was thinking, and people at that time, as they read it, would have thought. Or from the perspective of the owners, contemporary readers, where you read it with contemporary values, you project contemporary premises about reality into it. Uh, I'm told, actually, that uh, Shakespeare did not think that Romeo and Juliet was about the transcendence of love, the contemporary reading, that love is more important than anything else and willing, uh, I want something you should be willing to die for, which they did, of course. Uh, he, uh, a lot of people think, was actually much more on the side of the families. He thought that the young people, they were very young, were foolish and didn't know anything and stupidly killed themselves. And they should have just gone along with the program. It was much more about the stupidity of love than the transcendent importance of love. I'm not really sure what Shakespeare thought, of course, and that's the problem with uh, originalism. The original reading is uh, assuming, as the founders assumed, that anyone in power will abuse power. A written constitution is meant to constrain them. So it has a certain set of constraints. It tells you what the government can and can't do. It tells you what rights you do and don't have. And 
you have to stick to that in the original reading. Because if you allow the elites to say, no, 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 it really means something else, they will do that and exploit their power. So the whole purpose of a written constitution is to read it as the people who ratified it thought it meant. And if you're going to change it, you have to change it in this open and honest way. But it does not evolve. It is not living. Uh, the living constitution is a completely different idea. The idea is that it has to be living and evolving in a democratic society because important concepts like liberty or equality change and evolve over time. And as the document speaks of these things and speaks of other rights, these rights can expand. And we trust the justices of the court to see these evolutions and to move in the direction that society is moving. So uh, a living reading and an original reading are not reconcilable in any way. You really do have to decide as a matter of principle how you're going to read this. Uh, the religion cases and uh, the question of how you read the First Amendment makes this extremely clear. In a living reading, the prevailing facts that we have moved to a much more secular society, we used to be a dominantly religious society and we have gone through a long period of evolution. And we are now, uh, if you look at the public opinion polling and popular culture, we're more uh, secular than religious. That means that the values of the constitution have shifted along with that. In an original reading, that's not true at all. The change in public values have nothing to do with it. The, the, the meaning of the First Amendment about religion is the meaning that it was then. If you want to change it, if values have changed to such a degree that we amend and alter the Constitution, then fine. But until you amend it, it means the same thing. So the secular shift has either decreased religious rights or it has not. In fact, it has increased the importance of religious rights in the original ruling because uh, rights are a minority protection. And if you switch the majority to minority, rights actually go up. So you really do have to decide in looking at the religion uh, doctrine and cases if you're taking an original or a living reading because it completely changes uh, whether the religious rights protections, especially free exercise of religion, have gone down in power or up. The Supreme Court has recently switched from one view to the other view. And there's no other way really to put this. Uh, we have shifted from a control of a largely living to a largely original constitution. And this has a massive change in how the court will look at what rights we hold and what those rights mean. So let's go to the second point. Uh, what this means for the change in religion doctrine. The last five years have seen a truly remarkable shift. You could ask, well, why does it go back actually for five years, given what I just said about the Trump justices in the last two years, where it really changed last year. There was a, an evolution that had been happening and then a true break and change just last year. To understand the previous uh, changes, it goes back, you, you can take it back uh, pretty far, but I think it goes back about five years, 2017. The major case is Trinity Lutheran in 2017. If you know that case, that was the one about whether if a state were giving playground funding, they were redoing rubber playgrounds uh, for daycares. Uh, normal daycares got the money, but if it was a church-owned daycare, they wouldn't give it to you. Not to the church, but to the church-owned daycare. And the court ruled, no, 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 no. If, if you're giving playgrounds, you have to give playgrounds to everybody. That was not a liberal conservative break. It's very important to see that was a seven to two decision. Only Sotomayor and Ginsburg dissented on it. But the other two mostly liberal justices at that time, uh, Breyer and Kagan, they joined with the conservatives. In other words, even the mainstream liberals like Kagan see that kind of neutrality as the right decision. It didn't rely on the Trump justices. 
The same was true in Mashpee's Cake Shop in 2018. We're going to mention that again in regard to 303 Creative, the current service denial case. It's always very important to remember that was a 7-2. That was not the conservatives against the liberals. That was also Kagan and Breyer, who agreed that if a state civil rights commission says insulting things to a religion, whatever that religion might be, they, they can't do that. And that throws out the case. But Breyer agreed with that and Kagan agreed with that. Uh, the same is true with some of the other cases in that evolution until you hit the Espinoza case in 2020. And this was one that dealt with direct public school funding. And now you hit the break between the liberals and the conservatives. And Kagan and Breyer do not agree with spending public money on direct public school funding, not playgrounds, but actual school funding. And education is where they draw the line. And education is the big break. But that was all even before the big doctrinal change and the revolutionary shift to an original constitution. That just happened this year. So uh, let's talk very briefly about Carson and Kennedy. And I'm going to say a couple things about what the actual doctrine changes are. They're really quite important to see what they are. Media often speak in terms of the winners and losers, but it actually is the doctrine that counts. So you all, uh, I'm sure, are familiar with the Carson and Kennedy cases. Uh, uh, quick synopsis of Carson. Uh, it's about schools in snow country. Uh, it's in Maine. Y'all can understand this. But um, I taught in uh, Maine for a year. This is not an Arizona problem. Uh, but Maine has uh, signs that say, watch for moose in road. And uh, they're not kidding. Uh, there are giant moose that you will run into. Uh, especially when you go into the northern part of the state. I always used to want to get out of my car and uh, pencil in uh, with a Sharpie or something uh, and squirrel after the moose. No one else thought that was funny, but I did. And um, they had these snow corridors. I was on base college campus and uh, you can't get rid of the snow. They just dig out corridors and you walk through these snow canyons for about two months to get in between the buildings. It's really quite something. But under conditions like that, when the northern half of the state has more moose than people, they don't have public school systems because there's too few students, they can't afford it. So what they do is they give money to families to pay for private schools and they can go to any private school they want, even international ones, uh, for a certain amount of money. I think it's 10,000. Uh, but in the 1980s, Maine said, you can't use that for sectarian schools, for religious schools. And that's what the case was about. If the state is paying private school tuitions for secular schools, do they have to also pay it for Christian schools, or religious schools? And uh, the court said, yes, uh, on grounds of neutrality, which is a very important concept we're gonna talk about. This was quite revolutionary. The Kennedy case, I think, is the more important one. And you, all, uh, you know, this is about the praying coach case out of Seattle. And there's a lot of debate about the facts. And the Supreme Court looked at one specific set of facts. So it's very important to see. It's appropriate to complain about their selection of facts, but it's important to see that the ruling is only about the facts that they spoke of. And those facts are that the coach was told not to pray after the games in a public fashion on the 50 yard line. And he continued to do so. And he was fired for that. And the constitutional question is, is it a violation of free exercise of religion if a public school fires an employee for a personal expression of religion in public in front of students when he or she is on their own personal time. There's a lot of debate about whether he did things uh, in other fashions, but that's not what the case was about. Uh, your personal time is analogous to when, if you had taken a phone call and you were talking to your spouse and saying, oh, what's, what are we doing for dinner in this purely secular fashion, would you have been fired for that? And if the answer is no, then you can also make a religious expression, even if other people can see it. It's personal, even if it occurs in public. 
Uh, and the ruling uh, was that they could not fire him and had to reinstate him. Again, this is truly remarkable. And in the case, uh, Roberts describes it, I'm gonna read this quote here, as applying unremarkable principles of religious neutrality. Sotomayor says in response that the consequences of the court's rapid transformation of the religion clauses must not be understated. Sotomayor is right. It is a massive and rapid uh, transformation. If you want to see a little bit more about this, by the way, I really recommend, uh, this is the uh, the book series that I edit, uh, the SCOTUS books. This is SCOTUS 2022. Uh, it's available on Amazon and places and whatnot. Um, I just edited it, but it's written by really interesting scholars around the country. The person who wrote uh, this brief chapter for a public audience explaining all of this is Howard Schweber. He's a uh, senior faculty at Wisconsin, and he's editor of Constitutional Studies, which is a good journal. And he does a great job explaining all this detail about the Kennedy case and what it all means. Uh, but let me give you the overview of the doctrine. This is what, if you, if you put these two cases together, this is what is really being said. And here, feel free to look at the doctrinal change part of that handout. It means three things. The first one is that the court is now asserting contra years, decades of discussion that the anti-establishment clause and the free exercise clause are not opposed to each other. Uh, and there's this phrase that Breyer used to like, that there is a play in the joints between the two, that if they seem to contradict each other. If, if you read them a certain way, they seem to have tension between them. There's a space in the there's a gray zone in which a state can decide for themselves. The play in the joints. Gorsuch is very clear. <clears throat> and the original reading is that that is not what they meant by that. They didn't mean them to be contradictory. The full phrase is Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, anti-establishment and uh, free exercise. Uh, Gorsuch, the way he explains this, they have one unified meaning, which means non-coercion. And my best phrase that I put together for this is what they're saying <laughs> is it means the government may never coerce anyone regarding religion in either direction toward compelling, supporting religion, or suppressing religion. The first part is the compelling, and the second part is the suppressing, and the question is coercion in both counts. But you don't read them as having this play in the joints, you read them as meaning one thing. It used to mean in the public school contents endorsement. And this was the ruling of the famous Lemon case in the 1970s until now, and they officially overruled and threw out Lemon. And the Lemon argument was that if a school, a public school were endorsing religion, that was violating establishment. And the new doctrine is that that is absolutely not the case. Endorsement is not the standard, coercion is the standard. Mere presence of religion in a public institution is not coercion. Uh, Gorsuch actually is quite laudatory toward it. He says it's uh, pluralism. A couple of quotes here. Uh, offense does not equate coercion. You can take offense to it, but that doesn't mean it's a, a coercing you in some way. He ties it to pluralism and tolerance. And this is the core quote. Learning how to tolerate speech or prayer of all kinds is part of learning how to deal in a pluralistic society, a trait of character essential to a tolerant citizenry. So if students see both things, secularism and religion under the new approach, that's, that's fine. This is mutual respect and toleration. One of the big problems with this is about coercion of children. The old argument used to be that these are not adults, these are kids, therefore they're much more easily coerced by people in authority expressing uh, religious views. Gorsuch is really clear that uh, that is not the new doctrine on a premise ground about what children are. And there's a huge debate in our society about what kids are. Are they full adults? Uh, are they special? And this has to do with video games. It has to do, there's a famous Supreme Court case on that. They're, they're, they're about criminal punishment, about all sorts of things. 
are they adults or not? And Gorsuch says secondary school students are mature enough to understand that a school does not endorse, let alone coerce them to participate in speech that it merely permits on a non-discriminatory basis. They're smart enough to understand this. Uh, what's coercive and what isn't is a serious question in public school environments. That's the second doctrinal change. The, the first is you read them together. The second is that it means coercion, not um, anything else like endorsement. The third one is the most important, and this is the major thing to see. The dual religion clauses now have redefined the definition of neutrality. Neutrality is still the touchstone, but the definition of, of neutrality and maybe reality has changed. Uh, they are now endorsing, um, this is my term and not theirs, but it's co-equal neutrality. That both religious and secular views are co-equals in the public square and public institution, including public schools. There used to be an idea and the dominant belief was that when you said neutral, you really meant mostly secular and the exception was religion. So neutrality was keeping religion out, all religions. And if you had a secular institution that was neutral. And it, you have to wrap your mind around this. The, the, the new court is saying that is not neutral. Co-equal neutrality means that you have a conversation between religious people and secular people. And neutral is that both are there. If it's literally co-equals and you force one to not be there, you only have the other, or if you force the other to not be there. So they're saying you have to have them both be there. And the old standard was you take the religious expressions out in public by school officials, but uh, so you're not coercing secular people. But the argument is that if you don't have it there and you have only secular, now you're coercing religious students. Religious students should be able to see both and secular students see both and everybody sees both. Co-equal neutrality, if you apply it to schools, if you apply it to all public institutions, is a massive shift in constitutional doctrine. And that is what has just happened. We're gonna see co-equal neutrality applied across a host of things, including the cases we're about to discuss and the future ones. Uh, Sonia Sotomayor ends her dissent by saying, these are fundamental changes in this course religion clauses jurisprudence. She's entirely right. This is a massive revolution in how we understand the law of the constitution. Uh, so let's go to our final uh, third point and we'll open it up to whatever uh, thoughts you have on this. There's so, there's so much going on here. Let me talk about uh, the future and the cases this year, what we are going to see. People don't normally like to make predictions, uh, con law people, uh, because they don't like to be wrong about it, uh, but I'm going to make predictions on these. I was at a panel at a, a conference before Dobbs came out. And a lot of the people, surprising number, this is faculty, were saying that they really didn't think the court was going to overrule Roe. They didn't think they had the courage to do it. Um, they weren't going to do what they did. And I was saying, I, I don't think y'all are listening. I don't think you're listening to what they're saying. If, if you listen to what they, they're saying, they're going to overrule Roe. They are going to say there's no constitutionally protected right to abortion. Um, I don't see, or they could completely contradict everything else that they have already said, but that's what they're gonna say. So if you listen to what they're gonna say, I think you can really uh, tell. They're going to side with the, um, with the website, the web site designer, and they're going to side with the postal worker on this ground of co-equal neutrality. So just really quickly, uh, 303 Creative is about a person who wants to be a website designer. And the state law says that they cannot discriminate against LGBT clients. Uh, and the woman is saying that, no, on, on religious grounds and free speech grounds, she wants to be able to only make wedding websites for traditional marriages. And the state will not allow that. 
The other case is the Graf case, and this is the one that just came up. If you don't know uh, Graf v. DeJoy yet, it's about a postal worker who objected to delivering on Sundays. And the post office said, no, you really have to uh, deliver on Sundays. And he said, no, no, there's a religious exception here. I, I, I should not have to do that. <laughs> and he simply wanted <clears throat> the other uh, workers to pick those up and he would trade around and uh, he eventually left the job because of this and he's saying that is not allowable under federal law so let's talk about the 303 creative case first this has two big elements to it <coughs> pardon me uh, the first one is that what we're talking about is rights in commerce this is a very important concept that you have many many rights uh, First Amendment, Second, Fourth, etc. And there's a question of whether you engage in commerce in the public square and you have an open business that serves everyone. Any of those rights go away or lessen in power? Do your First Amendment rights go down? Do your Second Amendment rights go down? Do your Fourth Amendment rights against search go down simply because you've opened a business? Uh, maybe the immediate answer is no, of course not. You, if you, just because you start a business doesn't mean the government can now search you. Uh, but there's an argument that if you're serving the public and there are anti-discrimination laws, maybe it does alter in an important way. Uh, the court is going to decide that rights and commerce stay the same. Entering into commerce does not change your collection of rights. The bigger doctrine is about co-equal neutrality and about the nature of coercion. Remember we said earlier that if you read the dual religion clauses as a whole in an originalist reading, they mean non-coercion on any side, not coercing religious people, not coercing secular people, the state not coercing anyone. And if you ask this question in regard to 303 creative, who is being coerced? It's very important to see here, <clears throat> you have to remember who's suing. And this answers the question uh, of how you categorize these cases. For example, the Masterpiece Cake Shop, about the cake denial for um, an LGB wedding. Is that a LGBT rights case or is that a religious rights case? It's actually more of a religious rights case. And the reason for that <clears throat> is that they're the ones who are suing. They're the ones who are claiming that their rights were violated. Same is true in the Fulton case about adoption. And the same is true here. The cases where the court is siding with the religious side, it's because it's a religious plaintiff saying that religious First Amendment rights have been violated. And the same is true here. What the court is going to say is that if you ask who's being coerced, it's not the couple, because the couple, if they go to business A, they can also just go to business B, and there's plenty of businesses who will give them the product. So they're not losing out. They're not being coerced by the state in this way. They might be being coerced a bit by private citizens, but that's not as protected as the state. Rights are against the state much more than they are against other citizens. But it is actually the business that's being coerced into doing something. Uh, which is why the coercion argument as a doctrinal change is so remarkably important. Uh, so I think that's what they are going to say in 303 Creative. I, uh, in fact, I don't have any doubts about it. There's one of the glitch to it. They are framing it in terms of free speech rather than freedom of religion. And it's important to see what's going on here. Uh, because they're framing it in terms of free speech, they're saying that the First Amendment that uh, has protections for uh, religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition all together. And if you violate any one, you violate all of them. The ruling is actually limiting the religious claim to religion combined with speech. That's actually very important because believe it or not, the current court is seeing that as the compromised position. The extreme religious rights position is that any religious entity can deny service to anyone on religious grounds. And they're saying that that's not right. They're saying it's only when it is an expressive thing. So if it's a website designer or speechwriter, 
this is an important distinction that Jack Phillips made in the original Masterpiece Cake Shop. He was saying that if he had a cake he'd already made, he would sell it to anyone regardless. It was only if you asked him to use his own expressive ability to make a certain message personally, knowing who it was being sold to. It's the difference between commodities and personal products. This does not apply to commodities. It will not apply to stores, uh, just mainstream stores, um, restaurants, anything of that nature. It only will apply to expressive conduct. Uh, the line between that is going to be interesting, uh, but that is what they're going to say. There's a lot of problems with this. Uh, one is about harm. There's the harm to LGBT couples, uh, but it's a dignitary harm. And this is the problem that Anthony Kennedy, Justice Kennedy ran into, that dignitary harms are not directly protected under the constitution and they're not from the state, they're from other people. And the original constitution does not recognize a right to dignitary harm. So the originalists will not recognize this. There's another argument that if this applies to gay couples, it applies to uh, race as well. Uh, I don't want to, be, want to be very clear about this. They're going to distinguish those two. That is not the case that if it applies to gender or sexuality, it has to apply to race as well. They will say that is not true for important reasons. And uh, I think they will stick to those in the future. Uh, in the Groff case, it's going to come down the same way. The question is whether you have to make accommodation if there is a cost to the business. And the old rule was that, well, you have to accommodate religious claims, but not if it costs the business anything. And they're going to say that that's not true. The business has to pay a cost. Uh, we're not sure how that high that cost is, but Graf is going to win that one as well. So what does this mean? Uh, to summarize it all up, and uh, let's open it up for any uh, discussion, ideas that you have, things you wanted to talk about. Uh, this is a dramatic change in constitutional regime from a living to an original constitution. It's, you, this cannot be exaggerated how big a change this is. It's a change in how we read the religion clauses. It's a movement from endorsement to coercion. The biggest thing is the redefinition to co-equal neutrality. And this means that the religious presence in public institutions, schools and other things is going to increase uh, dramatically. And that is what all of this means. Okay. Um, once again, these Friday discussions can um, sometimes send us off into the weekend, not feeling great. Um, there was a brief discussion about uh, moose and squirrels that I'll leave yes. out of the question and answer portion. <laughs> Um, but Diane Post, who is the head of our legal department, she says, uh, I don't agree that the authors of the Constitution can be relied on as originalists, re separation of church and state, as there is much evidence of their statements that they were deists and believed church should not rule us. Do you care to speak to that? Um, not sure exactly. See, so, uh, the important thing to recognize here is that. The originalist argument and then the living argument, you have to decide which one you're really taking. Uh, I think, is she saying that the, even if you take an originalist position, there's much more separation of church and state involved? I, I take it to mean that's what she's saying. Let, let's say it's an honest, it's a question of whether it's an honest or a dishonest originalist position. One of the things you have to really separate out is there are people who just want a conservative outcome, so they just claim the conservative outcome. They're, they're not actually originalists. Uh, Akhil Amar is the person to really listen to on this. It's really interesting. He's politically quite liberal, but is convinced that originalism is correct. Uh, and he comes to some really fascinating positions on this, that if you do it honestly, uh, the question from an original perspective, agreeing th with the court about originalism, is what uh, is meant by the dual clauses. Does it mean a separation of church and state? The originalists say no, that that idea was a Jefferson idea, but it wasn't the idea that was discussed and put into the clauses and that people ratified, that it had a more limited meaning about the idea that if you read these two things as a whole and you, you ask yourself, what, what's going on here? Uh, Anti-establishment meant that they could not coerce you and 
the free exercise meant you could be as religious as you want. So the government can't stop you and um, they can't make you. They can't make you, they can't stop you. But it was assuming a pretty strong religious presence. Uh, and these were religious people. It's important to understand about uh, deists. Deists weren't secular people. Deists were deeply religious people. They just weren't churchy. They thought that churches were bad, but they believed that there was a supreme creator, God, who gave us rights and put this responsibility on us, let things just happen. The deists thought that God didn't intervene. It wasn't providential. That God just let the chips fall. But it was our responsibility to do things. But they thought the churches weren't helping, but they thought that religious people were helping in the sense that they were devoted to building a free society. It's important to remember that Jefferson, Jefferson's personal motto was obedience to God is rebellion to tyrants. It's the other way around. Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. That was his personal motto. It was on the gates of Monticello. He was a religious man who believed that God gave him certain responsibilities. That's the original view. Now, you ain't got to like it. right? You, we, we may have changed. The living view is that we should have moved beyond that and evolved with uh, American values. And the living position truly is that as we have moved to believe there is a separation of church and state, that anti-establishment means much more than you just can't have a church, but it means you can't have religious people in positions of authority influencing children. Uh, it, so it, I think it's just really important to say, are you buying the original and that's the original and what's the honest original view? And then what's the living view and what are you really saying and doing. Um, this is an incredibly important uh, debate that we should be openly having about what does it mean that we've become a secular society? Does it mean those values have changed? Or does it mean that we go with the original view of First Amendment? Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back and look up here. I think I saw, let's see. You know, presence is coercion, especially when a respected adult is doing it. That's a comment yeah. from Susan. By the way, let me talk about that. That's the Kennedy thing. The idea that he's a coach. A lot of people have spoken about this. Schweber, Howard Schweber in uh, SCOTUS 2022 talks a lot about this. Uh, coaches have this uh, odd influence in high schools, the way that I remember it. It was a long time ago that I was in high school, but I remember them having this vast outside, outsized influence over teachers. So what the coach does, people emulate, and this is incredibly important to understand. So uh, there, it opens the door to this kind of coercion and influence. What you have to ask yourself is this, is the court correct about co-equal neutrality or is that nonsense? If you say secular is normal and religious is an exception that is coercive, then coaches can't be publicly religious. But if, it's, if they're co-equals, and if you're saying that, well, there's secular students who can be coerced by religious people in authority, but it's also true that religious students or people inclined to that can be coerced by secular in authority. If you go to a fully secular school, ask yourself who's being made fun of right now in schools. Is it the religious kids or the secular kids? And I assure you in the 1950s, the ones being made fun of were the secular kids by the religious majority. Uh, who's being made fun of in schools now? If it's the religious kids by the secular majority, then there's something to be said here about who's coercing whom and who has presence. Uh, that's a lot to wrap around, I, I, I think, but that's what the court is saying. And I think that's a really important thing for us to decide what we think about that. Is it coercive if you just have a religious teacher and you realize, oh, that's not weird? Or do we want it to be weird? And we want all of the religious presence to be stricken out um, so that it's not coercive. And of course, there's what we want, and there's what the Constitution says. Um, speaking of religion in schools, by the way, if you do, any of you uh, get wind of any proselytizing happening in our public school, please make sure that you reach out to info at secularaz.org, um, and we will put it to our legal team. Uh, that is yeah. one of the things that they do. Um, there, here's one oh, from Brandon. Can I say just one quick word on that? That's a really important concept. 
if you take the full facts of Kennedy, then the court is allowing that kind of proselytization. If you only take the limited facts of Kennedy, it's very important to see they only rule on the limited facts. But if he were doing that in class, fired. If he were doing that, um, if he were inviting students to join him directly, fired. It's, it's important to say he's only expressing religion in front of students, but not proselytizing. A lot of people have said that the Kennedy decision means that teachers can open up class with prayers. No, 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 no. No, it does not say that, and they cannot do that. Uh, that is definitely constitutionally not permissible, even under the current doctrine. People are going to start trying because they're going to misapply Kennedy, but that, that's not what they said. Uh, we have another question here from uh, Brandy. Uh, Brandy uh, Reese says, there's a bill in the Arizona legislature right now. Um, I think it's, I think it's, I, I'm seeing HB 1002 here, but I think it's actually SB 1001. It doesn't really matter, but it's a bill that allows teachers to decline to call their students by their preferred pronouns mm -hmm. or nicknames uh, mm -hmm. according to their own deeply held religious beliefs. It passed out of the house this week with a due pass recommendation. Yeah. Thankfully, Governor Hobbs has said she will not sign it, but it brings up an interesting question as to how far does someone's own religious beliefs extend? Yeah. Yeah, uh, we're, we're going to find out. That is an utterly unclear under the original view of the Constitution. Um, there's what sounds reasonable and what a public school could take, which is to say uh, we have anti-discrimination principles and most states have anti-discrimination laws that apply within schools. So if someone is asking to be called a certain thing or use certain pronouns or use a different gendered name that anti-discrimination principles require that you go along with this and you have no right to object to anti-discrimination principles. Uh, the issue that's going to happen if it comes to a constitutional reading about, and again, you have to ask yourself this question, right? Who's being coerced? Ask who's being coerced in that situation, who the state is coercing. There's private people. You and I could coerce each other right now, but that's not constitutionally protected. You're, you have rights against the state, not against me. I could have said anything that offended you. You have no right against that. Um, it's a right against the state. Uh, it's very important, by the way, to mention, I didn't mention this, but I'm just speaking as a private person, scholar who studies this. I work for a public university, but I'm not speaking for the state of Massachusetts in any way, and they don't think that I am. But uh, the question that's going to be asked in the um, constitutional reading of this is who has a right? What right is there? And this is where the giant disagreement comes in. Clearly, there's a First Amendment right to freedom of expression of religion. No question. It's a question of what it means, but it's clearly there. Is there a right to um, equality of treatment grounded in sexual identity? Well, now we get into a debate. The Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, in the original view, what was that talking about when I said equal protection? It was talking about black folk. It was, it, was, it was saying, treat black folk the same as white folk. That's what it was about. It was a civil war amendment about race. Everybody agrees to this. This is why Brown v. Board is just not even questioned by originalists or by anybody, anybody reasonable, uh, because that's clearly what it means. And then, but that's the original reading. The evolved reading is that the principle then applies to women. So it applies to gender, equal protection of everyone who has been historically discriminated against. And then it applies to LGBT, but that's the extended version, the living version. The original version is, well, that's not what the people who voted for it thought it meant. You could do that, but we just have to add it on. If we vote for it now and change with an amendment, then of course it's protected. But so now you have a problem in the uh, teacher and the pronoun cases, uh, and the same is true in the bathroom cases in public schools that you have a right that's clear against a right that is unclear. And you see which one's going to be privileged over the other. And now you get into a problem with it. But um, again, these are public employees. You give up some rights as a public employee. So 
um, th that does not mean that even the originalist court is going to say the public employee teachers are not bound by anti-discrimination law. They're still bound because of what they're doing. You wouldn't, but a public school teacher might. Th this is going to be another case. This one will go to the court eventually. This is really unclear what they're going to do. Um, so I have kind of, this one's more of a comment, and then I have two more questions. Um, Beth, who uh, also assists our legal uh, team, she says this equality doctrine is saying secular people are free to pray or proselytize in their own way too, but they don't do that. The only unwanted exposure happening is by religious people to non-religious people. It's a one-way street. So that's really just a comment. Mm -hmm. um, and then Diane has another question. Can you address the issue of how much a court can question a person's sincerely held religious belief. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, both of those are fascinating. I completely agree with that first comment that the, the longstanding view is that secularism is the neutral thing because it's an empty set, right? And then the question is that the First Amendment, especially anti-establishment, deals with religious presence. And you assume secularism, which is a null set, and the question is, do you add in any religious belief? The original view is not that. It is that these are two parts of an argument, that there, our society has always had religious and secular people. And what is represented, what is there, everyone. You don't shunt out one side or the other side. Uh, there's a really interesting case uh, where Thomas started arguing this uh, back in 2000. And let me read you this quote, it's really interesting. We cannot say the danger that children would misperceive the endorsement of religion, they would see endorsement of religion by religious presence as being coercive, is any greater than the danger that they would perceive a hostility toward religious viewpoint if the club were excluded from the public school. And this is about whether a religious club can use school uh, grounds. And what he's saying here is that it's not the case what whoever that was asserted that well secularism is just not coercive it's only, you can only coerce religious people can coerce secular people but secular people can't coerce religious people if you live in a society where you see a bunch of religious and secular but then you go into a public school that's only secular you know what they're doing so the argument is that you actually are telling people what's good and bad and if you know that some of those people who are teachers must be religious but they've all been told to hide it you're told what's acceptable behavior and kids pick up on acceptable. Uh, this is a really revolutionary argument, by the way. They're arguing that co-equal neutrality means that there's coercion in both directions, so you have to have both. And at a very young age, school children have to realize, oh, there's a bunch of other things and um, I may be secular and I may not know what praying even is, but there it is. I have to learn what this is. Really, interesting uh, change. And I forgot the second question, but I thought it was really interesting when you said it. Um, again, this one's from Diane. And the question was, can you address the issue of how much a court can question a person's sincerely held religious belief? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is really important that you mention this. Uh, there was a very important case. If you look at the religion cases from last year, one that we didn't talk about was Ramirez v. Collier. This is a death row case, and you might note that it's eight to one. And the liberal justices are agreeing with the conservatives that uh, there was a death row inmate who said that he had to have under religious right, his pastor lay on hands on him as he was being put to death. And the state said, no, you can't have your personal guy in the chamber like that. And he said, no, I can't because I have this right under federal law and under the First Amendment. And the liberals agreed to it because they don't like the death penalty. It was delaying a death penalty. And the conservatives agreed to it based on religious claim. But there was one person who didn't agree to it. And that was Clarence Thomas. And you would think he would be on the side of the religious plaintiff because he is very pro-religious rights. And he's the one who wrote that thing I just talked about, about the Good News Club case. But what he very specifically said was, you're missing the point here. This guy is not... A Christian. This guy is not anything. This guy's a liar. This guy's just using a claimed religious belief. He's a psychopath. He's a horrible human who killed people and is being put to death. 
Cla uh, Clarence Thomas says that um, who's to say if his religious belief is sincere or not? Clarence Thomas says him. He says it's not sincere. That's why he's voting against it. There's no evidence this is a, sin a sincere belief. The court used to take the view that you couldn't question religious assertions, but, and here's the big but, because religious rights are being expanded by the court, and this goes back to the Hobby Lobby case. So they said that because Hobby Lobby is a Christian corporation, which is a very strange phrase if you think about it, that a corporate entity can be a religious entity, like really, et cetera, that uh, Hobby Lobby, Chick-fil-A, um, and small businesses that are personally owned. And the question is, well, wait, wait, what? If you're going to let them have these rights, then you have to be able to judge who's fraudulent. So the court is abandoning uh, 100 years of saying we're not going to judge uh, religious claims to say, well, now we have to judge religious claims. And some of them, they're going to claim to be fraudulent. The onus is going to be on a person. If you're a business, you're like, oh, a religious business, it, you have to have a long history of it. It has to be in your documents. It has to be in your practice. You have to be closed on Sundays. You have to do these things. If you can't show it, you are not. And uh, interestingly, that's going to move toward people as well. You can't make a fake religious claim because the lower courts will throw it out and say you're not. Uh, so uh, because there are religious rights now, there will be questions of religious sincerity now. It's, an, um, it's a new world. There's a lot of ramifications of all these doctrines. Right. Um, we are almost out of time, and I know your time is valuable. We do have a question here from Kurt. Well, also some kudos from Deborah saying, great discussion. Uh, Susan saying, it's very interesting. Thank you. Um, but Kirk says, given that most non-religious people view religious belief as delusional in nature, um, how does the court justify its co-equal neutrality position? Yeah, right, right, right. Um... Uh, take a look at this this last book of mine about uh, One Nation, Two Realities, about different perceptions of reality. Uh, and I'm writing this new one uh, now about the Supreme Court of Facts, about how they deal with these factual things. What people think of as insane is that you see things that are not there. The classic definition of insanity is a schizophrenic who sees the rabbit and you don't. They see things that you do not see. They see things that are not real. Uh, the problem that we all recognize is that sometimes the person is the one who's right that you think is crazy, and then you realize, oh, we just haven't seen it yet. What is crazy and what isn't is a deep, deep problem. And uh, the biggest things that we have about assertions that people take extremely seriously and have legal ramifications and social ramifications that other people think are crazy are God and rights. I say I am a creature of rights. I say this as many times in public as I possibly can. I am a creature of rights. That means that I inherently hold rights from the time of my creation. And it doesn't matter what the majority says. And, uh, but now a lot of people say that ain't true. If you talk, when I talk to my Chinese international students, they think rights are insane. They think I'm a crazy person. Rights do not exist. Collective judgment exists. If the collective says you have to do this, you have to do it. What do you mean you have rights? What are you, insane? What is a right? Some magical rights fairy gave you rights? And in our society, we have elections. We have reasonable things. If somebody says you have to do X and do it right now, and the majority says so, are you crazy that you say you have a right and you don't have to? Why in the world are you some nutbag who thinks you have rights, crazy person? What are you even talking about? If you believe in majority rule, why in the world do you have rights? Because the rights fairy gave it to you? Because a couple of guys in powdered wigs in 200 years ago said they believed God, literally said they believed God gave you these rights, as they said in the declaration. They just said a magical entity gave you rights. But if you don't believe in the magical entity that our forefathers said gave us rights, and we all now believe we have rights, let me ask you a very powerful and important question. If God's a delusion, why do you have rights? because they said that's why you have rights. Now you can start giving answers because we collectively believe in them because the constitution itself has become this magical, the constitution is God, it has given this to us. Or the living constitutional answer, the social rights answer that we have the rights we collectively give to each other. That makes perfect sense. 
uh, even if the, the people in the past thought that the, the the magic gave it to us, we now think it's collectively granted. They thought it was magic, but we think we know what they did. It was about power. But if you really believe that they only come from a collective agreement, well, then the collective can take away that agreement. And when the collective takes away that agreement, you no longer have that right. And if rights are dependent on majority beliefs, they're not rights. Rights are things against the majority belief. So the problem here is that um, we have this long, long standing human belief in a supreme being. And a lot of contemporary people think that's utter lunacy, but they're not quite willing yet to take those people and put them in insane asylums because there's too many of them. So what do we do with those people? It's a really interesting question, but it's also about rights. What do we do with those people? And we absolutely do not have a society that believes fully in majority rule about everything, radical democracy. Frankly, between you and me, that is a horrifying system. If you have any countercultural beliefs or you're in the minority on anything, you do not want radical democracy. You should be a huge fan of rights and you should say it loud with me. I am a creature of rights. However you believe you got them, you, 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 you best keep them. Now, of course, you have a problem that if, if you have to respect the rights you like, then you have to respect the rights you don't. And if you like free speech, um, you also have to take freedom of religion, which is bound with speech. These are all problematic things. But uh, the gentleman who mentioned that, um, it is a real question, uh, what's crazy and what isn't. And we no longer agree on that. We used to have a consensus society that agreed on what was rational, what was crazy. Not anymore. No. All right. And I, I really hope that you can answer. I have one more question left. I know we're over time. Um, this one comes from Ziggy and it says, can because maybe this question can actually give us some hope. I hope maybe. Um, it's always good to, to stop on it. Let me be clear that I, I'm trying my dead level best to say exactly what the current reality is. Um, mm -hmm. I was saying when I was on that panel and everybody is saying, oh, no, they're not going to do this. Not gonna... Yes, they are. Okay. <laughs> Listen to what people say. I'm telling you what the law, the doctrine, decisions in the future are. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. So but this yeah, one yeah. comes, yeah, yeah, this one comes from Ziggy. Um, considering the ongoing shift toward secular views, especially among millennials and Gen yeah. Zers, do you think that the present SCOTUS decisions will act as a catalyst that moves us closer to the Overton window? That is to say, where secularization becomes the norm and is being accelerated by these attempts at eroding the wall of separation. That is a distinctly possible future. My students, now this is in Massachusetts, so things vary around, but by and large, my students are not happy with this trajectory. They're much more comfortable with the living constitution. Of course, when it agrees with what they want, but they're, they're uh, but we definitely have a disjuncture between society as a whole and the contemporary Supreme Court, which is why this discussion of how you read the Constitution and what does it mean and what it really is an originalism, uh, uh, what really is a living constitutionalism, what are they saying here, uh, what are they saying about the nature of rights, how do we really want to understand this. It is quite possible that you take the Dobbs case and you take all these religion cases and you put them together, current attacks on the legitimacy of the Supreme Court. And uh, it's also a very interesting phenomenon that we didn't talk about, that the members of the Supreme Court are religious people themselves, almost all observant Catholic. And there's a reason why it's Catholic and not Protestant, and there's long history here. And these uh, the, the, there are connections to personal religious beliefs. And if people are going to move the other way because of it. In the future, this will be settled <clears throat> in terms of future elections. In the same way, this was an electoral effect. It happened very quickly because Trump got three appointees, which doesn't happen much uh, in this quick space of time. He had one presidency in three. That, that, that doesn't happen. Uh, so it'll be settled in that way. And if constitutional politics traditionally has not been a big part of electoral politics, but if it is in the future, which I think it ought to be, uh, because of what 
this person who asked that question, it was Ziggy, wasn't that uh, what Ziggy's saying here, that we should all take this seriously and discuss this, that may well lead to changes in the future. But it's a long term path. And it's very important to understand that uh, this will play out over the long term. But we have a long period of time of an original constitution uh, in the future. All right, well, it is 1.07 on a Friday. Um, let's see, hold on, okay. Thank you for putting up the link, Lindsay. Thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Marietta, for joining us today. I really appreciate you. All of your links have been put into the chat here. Um, I, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head who's coming to join us next week. I believe it's somebody from, I don't know if you can help me out with that, Lindsay. But anyway, we've got great programming. Um, and again, of course, there we go. Uh, oh, good. The that's right. Religious Exemption Accountability Project. So that one uh, should be an interesting discussion, too. Thank you again, Dr. Marietta. Thanks for everybody else uh, for joining us. And I hope that we can maybe see some hope in the youth of our nation being engaged and, you know, following what's going on and being mindful of the Constitution as they move forward and try to make our world a better place. <laughs> Thank you Thanks. all so much for having me. Thanks, everybody. Me. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.